Have any of you ever had a recurring dream? One that would just sort of pop up every now and then? Well, I want to tell you about a recurring dream I had from uh, years ago. Uh, for a period of a few years, um, just out of nowhere in the middle of the night, this dream would show up. And in this dream, I was in college, and it was the beginning of a new semester. So I, I signed up for a, a course and attended uh, probably the, the first week of classes. And then I, for some reason, I don't remember why, but I just decided, well, I'm, I'm going to ditch the rest of the semester. So time went on, and, and we get down toward the end of the semester, and I come to the realization there's going to be a final exam. And the day of the exam comes up, and I step out on the campus. I'm looking around. What, what building was that class in? And I'm searching and searching, and then, you know, finally, one building becomes at least vaguely familiar. So I thought, well, I'm going to go look there. So I go in the building, and then, uh, all right, well, what was the classroom? And so I'm searching up and down the hall, floor to floor, and finally I look in a, in a door, and I see a familiar face. Oh, that's the instructor. So, and, and he's just about to hand out the final exam, and I, I walk into the classroom, and all eyes fasten on me. And finally, one of them says, well, what are you doing here? And then I'd wake up. <laughs> I, I was all, all sweaty, my heart pounding. <laughs> Let's pray. Dear Father, I just ask in a special way that you would put your words in my mouth and put your words in the ears of all of us, that we not hear the faulty words of the speaker up front, but that we hear your still small voice speaking to our hearts, bringing hope and encouragement today. So I thank you for hearing and answering this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tribe and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heaven, the earth, the seas, and the fountains of water. The hour of his judgment has come. There's something about final exams that are so, well, final. There's no retake. There's no extra credit. There's no skipping the exam. It's, it's pass or fail. And this hour of judgment message has been a source of much anxiety for, for many people for many years. You know, in the book of Hebrews, it says that it's appointed once for man to die, and then comes the judgment. And so, how are we to understand what this judgment hour message is all about? And I've come to find that really the best illustration of what this message is and when it comes is found in the sanctuary teaching of, of the Bible. The sanctuary doctrine is uh, one of maybe the, the least understood teachings of scripture. Uh, many Christians don't have a, even a single clue of what went on there, only that you know, Jesus is the Lamb of God, he paid it all, and so I'm good to go. Well, in the sanctuary 
service throughout the year in their worship cycles. They had their, their daily worship service. And then uh, throughout the year, they had seven annual feasts to, to observe. Four of those feasts came in the spring of the year. There was the Passover, the um, first fruits, there was the unleavened bread, all in the span of about a week. And then nearly two months later came the day of Pentecost. They looked backward to uh, the exodus of the children of, of Israel from Egypt, how God cared for them, how they uh, put the leavening out of their houses and, and ate unleavened bread as they left Egypt. Um, it was current in their time when they, when they observed this feast in that uh, it was the spring of the year and they would have the early harvest of, of the barley, that, which was one of the winter crops, and that was the first fruits that was offered uh, in Thanksgiving. And then later on in the spring was the, the Feast of Weeks that we call Pentecost. That was the, the full harvest of, of the winter crops. Well, they, uh, they tell us about the ministry of Jesus, about his sacrifice for our sins, and, and our deliverance. Um, I invite you to open up your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. That's 1 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8. And it's here that the Apostle Paul writes uh, to the Corinthian believers, he says, Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see what Paul was equating leavening with? It's, it's with sin. It's with the um, objectionable traits of our character, of, of malice and wickedness. So he's encouraging the Corinthian believers there, he's encouraging all of us to purge these uh, unrighteous traits of character out of our lives and to have with us the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Well, that was the, uh, the spring feasts. Later on, uh, a few months later, came the fall feasts. They were in the seventh month of the religious year, um, whereas the, the spring feasts were in the first month. So uh, the fall feasts also illustrate the, the second advent of Christ, just as the spring feasts illustrate the first advent. On the first day of the seventh month, was the, uh, the Feast of Trumpets. And it was a, a call to repentance. It was a call to examine your, your lives because a judgment day is coming. And then uh, on the 10th day of the seventh month was Yom Kippur, as, it, as they knew it. Uh, we know it as the Day of Atonement. And that, the observance of that day this year just happened to be last week. In any case, it was the most solemn day of the year. It, and when uh, one of them mentioned the day in conversation, they all knew that it was this particular day they were talking about, the Day of Atonement. That, that word atonement was an invention of William Tyndale in the 16th century. Um, break down that word, atonement is at, excuse me, <laughs> at one meant. 
um, it's bringing us together back in fellowship with the Lord. The, uh, the original Hebrew there uh, implied that there was a covering on this day, a covering for, for our sinfulness. But then five days later be, uh, came the Feast of Tabernacles. It was, again, a celebration that would look backward to the years that the children of Israel uh, dwelled in, in tents in the wilderness. Um, it's also, for the contemporary Jew, it was a, a time of celebrating their, their fall harvest of all the, all the crops of God's goodness to them throughout the year. And it also looks forward to when we'll take our flight toward our heavenly home. So to understand what the sanctuary teaches us is to understand what Jesus is doing in heaven. Psalm 77 and verse 13, this familiar verse says, your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? So what took place on the Day of Atonement, and what does it teach us about Jesus? Well, we won't go there right now. You can, uh, if you have interest, you can go to Leviticus chapter 16 sometime later. Uh, that outlines the procedures for the day of, of what took place on the Day of Atonement. And then also in Leviticus chapter 23, Lord uh, spoke about the solemnity of that day. It was a, a day that five times in, in the books of Moses, they were commanded to afflict their souls. You might say they were to examine themselves um, before God to, to know what their standing is. It was the one day in the year that God actually commanded a fast. Well, if we're in the great day of atonement, what kind of a fast would God command of us? Let's look at Isaiah chapter 58. It's Isaiah 58 and verses 6 to 8. And here the prophet Isaiah is quoting the Lord. Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 to 8. And, he's, and he wrote, Is not this the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal your bread to the hungry, and that you bring the poor that are cast out to your house? And when you see the naked, that you cover him, and that you hide not yourself from your own flesh, then, the Lord says, then shall your light break forth as the morning, and your health shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your, your rearward, your rear guard, in other words. So the Day of Atonement was a day to search your souls. It was a day to deny yourself uh, and rather consider the needs of others. So the high priest back in ancient times and in, in that service was a type of Jesus who is the great high priest. And, and so what we want to do is understand what the high priest did in type on the Day of Atonement and then see how Jesus is the fulfillment in anti-type. Let's, um, at the beginning of that day, the high priest wore his usual unique garments. They were uh, blue and, and purple and scarlet, and he had the turban with, with the uh, crown that said holiness to the Lord. 
Um, and it was on that day that the high priest uh, participated in all the services of, of the day, uh, whereas on, uh, on other days throughout the year, the, the common priest would be involved. But this was, on this day was all the work of the high priest. And the first thing he did was to offer the morning sacrifice shortly after sunrise. And in the daily service, every morning, every evening, a year-old lamb without blemish was offered um, to, to atone for the sins of the congregation. And then that blood was taken within the, the sanctuary and was sprinkled upon the veil that separated the two apartments, the, the holy place and the most holy place, of the, or known as first and second apartment. So um, let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 again, this time verses 9 and 10, and we'll see fulfillment there in the ministry of Jesus. That's Hebrews chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. And here uh, Paul is actually quoting in part Psalm 40, but um, Hebrews 10, verse 9, then said he, Lo, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. Well, what did he mean with, by that? He meant that Jesus was taking away the, the first covenant of all the animal sacrifice so he could establish the, the, the new covenant, the second covenant. And verse 10 explains this. He says, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Only once did Jesus need to to die, he does not need to die continually. So once this was accomplished, then the high priest would wash and he'd change, change his garments. He'd take off those royal garments of the high priest and then he would put on just the plain linen garments of the common priest. This tells us of um, Christ coming to our world. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. And these are familiar verses to us this morning. Hopefully all of these are. And if not, uh, I know we're moving rapidly, but if you feel like taking notes, you can uh, follow up on that later. But Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. And here... Uh, the word says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of of the cross. Consider for a moment that Jesus, the second person of the Godhead, had already veiled his glory to be Michael, the archangel, the head of the angels, but then he veiled his glory even further to take on human flesh to become like one of us. Um, he became our elder brother. And our el it's our elder brother that carries on his ministry in heavenly places today. As our elder brother, he gives us a new heritage by being born again and it's our elder brother that's there um, doing his work on our behalf. And 
try to wrap your mind around that. So the next thing the high priest would do was to present a young bull and two goats at the door of the courtyard. The, the bull was tethered. Well, they, they were all tethered. Um, but then the high priest drew lots for each of the goats. Um, the first lot that he drew out would be for what was known as the Lord's goat. And the high priest would take a scarlet uh, piece of scarlet yarn and wrap it around the neck of, the, of that goat. And then the other lot that he drew out would be for the scapegoat. Uh, and the scapegoat in scripture is called Azazel. And the high priest then would take that, a piece of scarlet yarn and wrap it around the horn of the goat, not around the neck. Then uh, the goats were tethered in the courtyard, and then the bull was slaughtered, and the blood was collected. But what happened next from there is the first of four times that the high priest would enter into the most holy place. The first time... He took a, a censer, uh, the vessel that would, would hold incense with coals from the, the bronze altar of sacrifice. He took that along with two handfuls of incense. Then he entered within the veil on the right side, which was the north side of the tabernacle. That's where the table of showbread was. The high priest would reverently set that censer down on the floor in front of the Ark of the Covenant, add the, the finely ground incense, the, um, the fumes, the, the vapors, the smoke of the burning incense would make a sort of, of cloud in the, in the most holy place and it would help to kind of shield a little bit more the, the presence of, of God in his Shekinah glory. Um, he, the high priest would offer a brief prayer with his eyes fixed upon the mercy seat. And we'll explain more of the symbolism there uh, shortly. But the mercy seat was the pure gold cover uh, to the Ark of the Covenant and the ark was just the wooden chest that was uh, covered in gold that hold the tablets of stone with the commandments that God wrote with his own fingers. So when did Jesus fulfill this part of the high priest service? Well, let's go to John chapter 20. John 20. And there, let's notice verse 17. And Jesus said to her, and the her is Mary Magdalene, he said, touch me not, don't detain me, don't prevent me, for I'm not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say to them, I, send to my, I ascend to my father and your father, to my God and your God. So on the morning of the resurrection, Jesus went to heaven briefly to be assured that his sacrifice was sufficient to advance the, the plan of salvation. And note his identity with, with us, with you and me. He said, go to my brethren and, and tell them I ascend to my father and to your father, to my God and your God. It's amazing Jesus' willingness to identify with us, um, God Almighty. So the second time 
that the high priest entered within the veil was with the blood of the bull. The bull had already been slaughtered, the blood collected, and then he took that, that blood within the veil. This is his second entry into the most holy place. And it was uh, sprinkled once upon the mercy seat and seven times before the Ark of the Covenant. And this part of the ceremony, uh, the, the blood of the bull was to make atonement for himself and for his family. It was to validate his ministry to continue in making intercession for the congregation. So when did Jesus fulfill that? Well, let's look at Revelation chapter 5. Revelation 5 and verses 6 to 8. And this is what the Bible says. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he, the lamb, came and took the book out of the right hand of him, his father, that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors of, of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. I, I submit to you, friends, that this scene in Revelation 4 and 5 has two fulfillments. The first fulfillment, I believe, was the heavenly scene of what took place on the day of Pentecost when the ministry of Christ was validated. He took the scroll and more than that, the ministry of the Holy Spirit was validated on that day. It descended down like tongues of fire upon those that were gathered in the upper room. And it, it kick-started the gospel message there in Jerusalem. And it's the ministry of the Holy Spirit that brings to us Christ in you, in me, the hope of glory. Without that, we'd, we'd have no hope. There is a second fulfillment to these chapters, and that comes at the time of the end, but that's a subject for another time. The third time that the high priest entered within the veil, this time he took uh, the blood of the Lord's goat within, and he entered the same way that he had entered the previous two times, and like he did with the blood of the bull, he sprinkled the blood of the goat once upon the mercy seat and then seven times before the Ark of the Covenant. When do we see that fulfilled? Well, Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. It's Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll notice verses 11 to 14. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, notice that, good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, but neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Notice the next two verses. Verse 13, For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies them to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 
the blood of the Lord's goat on the Day of Atonement was not like the blood of the lambs that were offered every morning and evening. The blood of the daily sacrifices was a defiling blood. It was sprinkled on, on the um, curtain, on the veil, and it accumulated in ancient, in the typical service, it accumulated the year's worth of, of transgressions and, and forgiveness that, that God had offered. But then on the Day of Atonement, the Lord's uh, goat and its blood was sprinkled uh, again upon the mercy seat one time and, at, and before the Ark of the Covenant seven times. This blood was a cleansing blood. It's hard to picture if you get blood on a piece of clothing, you don't hardly think it's going to get very clean, but, um, but you got to work with me on this one. It, um, Jesus shed his blood to pay the penalty for our sins, but he offers his blood in transfusion to us, giving us new life. So, a little farther down in Hebrews chapter 9, we see verse 22. And that says that almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So the life of the creature is in its blood, and the life of Jesus was in his blood got his blood from his father, his blood type, and there's life in that. And so what does the symbolism represent here? It's purging the Lamb of God who is represented as that golden cover to that wooden chest that holds the the tablets of stone Um, so and then uh, the blood before the ark was to cleanse um, the ark itself and and the contents of the ark and we need to um, we need to just let the imagery explain that to us And I've kind of lost my place briefly. Bear with me. Now we'll go back here. Um, The question is, when did Jesus begin this phase of his ministry, this end time cleansing ministry, this atonement ministry? Uh, we read this, and I'll, uh, for sake of time, we'll, I'll just read for you Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. I beheld till thrones were cast down, the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set and the books were opened. The setting for this is immediately following the description of the little horn power that that comes to power and and does all of its blasphemous work. Um, Then we read the next chapter, Chapter 8 of Daniel, verses um, 9 to 14, but I'm going to truncate this, um, again repeats the uh, diabolical ministry of of the little horn. It says that he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, by the daily sacrifice was taken away, the place of his sanctuary cast down. 
and a host was given against the daily sacrifice uh, and it cast down truth to the ground, it practiced and prospered. And I heard one saint speaking, another saint said to that saint which spoke, how long shall the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the transgression of desolation, to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel's told later on in that chapter and then uh, throughout the rest of the book that the things he was shown was to be for the time of the end, something way, way past his time frame. Um, so that tells us about a judgment scene. Um, what about the cleansing that... Uh, that Daniel was told about under 2,300 days, then the sanctuary would be cleansed. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 29 and 30 say this, this shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month, on the 10th day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be of your own country or a stranger that sojourns among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to, to judge you? No, to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So what we have here are two distinct scenes that don't seem to have anything in common, but we need to bring them together because they occupy the same space and time and event. So um, as far as the judgment goes, in Revelation 14, we're told that the hour of his judgment has come. And in Daniel 7, we're told that the judgment was set and the books were opened. Uh, regarding cleansing, we're told in Leviticus 16 that, um, well, first in Daniel chapter 8, that 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And then Leviticus 16, on that day shall the priest make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. How do we harmonize these two pictures? How do we reconcile a judgment scene with a cleansing scene? Let's start with cleansing the sanctuary. Well, why would the sanctuary need to be cleansed? Well, in ancient times, we know that those offerings were presented every day, twice a day, along with individual offerings for, for individual uh, transgressions. And once again, that blood was sprinkled on the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. But it was on the Day of Atonement that the blood of atonement was a cleansing blood. And that blood was applied to all of the places in the sanctuary that the defiling blood had been applied. So it's a, a ritualistic cleansing. Well, what's the reality of this? It's that when we confess our sins and ask forgiveness of God, that Jesus took that guilt upon himself. He took it with him to the cross, and he took it with him to heaven until such time uh, when the final disposition of sin would be dealt with. So what really needs cleansing? Is it some building, some structure in heaven where blood has actually made its way to, to defile? Is it God's dwelling place here on earth? Know you not that you are a temple of the Holy Ghost whose spirit is within you? Or is it the Lamb of God who took that defilement 
in his person to heaven. Well, let's let the atonement in imagery show us that answer. When the high priest's ministry was validated, he brought again the blood of the goat within the veil, sprinkled it on the mercy seat, and before the ark. What's all of this stuff? Well, the ark, again, was a wooden vessel, a, a box, if you will, that was covered in gold that contained the uh, tablets of stone that God had written commandments with his own finger. So what we have is a vessel containing God's law that's covered by a mercy seat or by a lid that represents Jesus. It was pure gold. And that cover was between the ark and its contents and then the visible presence, the veiled glory, if you will, of, of God. Um, the question is, is this not a portrayal of the new covenant experience? Are we not earthen vessels, jars of clay that God wants to write his laws in our hearts and minds? And until such time, isn't Jesus shielding us from God's infinite glory? Well, this, um, these are the verses of Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 and 27. There, Ezekiel uh, is quoting God again. He says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments and do them. We read a profound statement in a book called The Desire of Ages on page 668. And it says that if we consent, if we're willing, if we give God permission, he, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims and so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will that when obeying him, will be but carrying out our own impulses. The will, that's our power of, of choice, our decision. When the will is refined and sanctified, it will find its highest delight, its greatest joy in doing his service. And the statement ends that when we know God as it is our privilege to know him. Our life will be a life of continual obedience. That's a promise, friends. Does it feel like it right now? Do I have to be honest here? But it's something I aspire to. It's something every Christian should aspire to. So how does this judgment scene harmonize with the cleansing scene? Who's on trial here? Countless Christians for countless years have lived in suspense of their own salvation, of their eternal destiny. You've probably heard some say, well, I hope I am saved. Or some would say, well, what if I forgot to confess something? And what if my name already came up for review and I wasn't ready? Those are fearful thoughts. I believe those are planted by the enemy of souls. So I ask again, who's on trial? Now we know it's not Satan and his, his minions 
And how do we know that? Well, Jesus told us that in John chapter 16, verses 8 to 11. This is what Jesus said. He's speaking of, of the comforter, of the one that would be like him that would come and dwell in us. He says in verse 8, And when he, the comforter, has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no more. And of judgment, because the prince of this world now is now judged, or now stands condemned. As a real brief aside here, did you notice Jesus' own definition of what sin is? He said it is unbelief in himself, unbelief of his place in the Godhead, unbelief of his sacrifice for the sins of the world, unbelief of his kinship now with us, is unbelief of his power to save us. To Jesus, sin is a relational issue. It's not a behavioral issue. The behavior will come with the relationship. You can't put the cart before the horse. <laughs> so all the powers of darkness stand condemned at the cross where their evil designs were fully exposed to the watching universe, how they orchestrated the death of God himself in the person of Jesus. So it's not them. So who is being judged? Well, the hour of God's judgment can be understood two ways, maybe more, but two here this morning. We know that Satan is the accuser of the brethren, don't we? He accuses us day and night. He whispers little things in our ears. You're no good. You'll never go to heaven. But Satan also has made accusations to God. He's, and this is before the intelligent universe. Satan said that God's laws are, are arbitrary. They're laws just because God says so. And if you violate them, he's going to punish you. And, and God is really a, a tyrant. He wants to restrict our freedom. And so God has been on trial all this time. So I'd like to ask this question. If you were falsely accused of a crime, who would you want to defend you? Who will come to God's defense? Well, again, words of Jesus, John chapter 14, 8 to 10. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficed us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet have you not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And so how say you then, show us the Father? Believes you not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwells in me, he does the works. So God the Father has a good defender in God the Son. And then um, at the end of Luke chapter 24, just before Jesus is set to ascend into heaven, he said these words, Thus it is written, thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. Remission of sins. What is that? Taking them away. If your cancer's remission, 
It's gone. If our sins are in remission, they're gone. That, and they should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And then Jesus said, and you are witnesses of these things. And so are we. We are witnesses of these things. If I stood accused of something I was innocent of, I'd want the best defender available, and I'd want some friendly witnesses to vouch for my character. Wouldn't you? So God's character has been on trial for millennia. He has a righteous defender in the person of Jesus. Um, Jesus defended his father all the way to the cross of Calvary, to the tomb, to resurrection, and to ascension to heaven. Who are the character witnesses? They're you and me. They're the believers of every generation from the beginning, a people that have been forgiven and cleansed of their unrighteousness, who step forward in this judgment scene to vouch for the character of God, that God is love, that he's not tyrannical, that he does not punish sinners. That judgment process is a lengthy process. Uh, we know and could prove biblically that that 2300 year prophecy uh, came to an end in the fall of 1844 and so now the books are open and the intelligent universe sitting there get to see who the character witnesses are Does Jesus have to plead with his father? Oh, you got to save these people? No. Jesus has to plead with us, convince us of his love for us, his power to save, of his longing to come and take us home. We're the ones he needs to plead with. Fourth and final time the high priest entered within the veil was to remove the that censer of incense. When he did, then he mingled the blood of the bull and the goat and cleansed all the places in the sanctuary that had been defiled with the defiling blood of the lamb. And then when that was done, he went to the other goat, the living goat, the scapegoat, and confessed all the accumulated sins of, of that year on the head of that goat. That goat was not slain. It was taken somewhere into the distant wilderness where it would live out its days and eventually die on its own. And then the high priest would put on his, his unique kingly royal garments again. He would step out and pronounce this blessing, a familiar blessing, but you find it in Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so everything was clean once again. And when this process of review taking place right now is complete, and when you and I and a living generation have been cleansed from the penalty of sin, our transgressions, 
that's in the courtyard, we're cleansed of the power of sin, our unbelief in the holy place, and cleansed of the presence of sin, all of our iniquities, all of our sinful uh, propensities, all of our appetites for, for sinful things, that takes place in the most holy place. When we're cleansed of all of that, then it's time for our great high priest, Jesus Christ, to divest himself of all the forgiven sin that he had taken upon himself, all the transgression, all the iniquity. He took it all from us. And then he will pronounce these words found in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 11. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. There's something really, really, really final about those words. Then Jesus, our great high priest, will take off his high priest garments. He'll put on his royal garments, king of kings, lord of lords, and he will come with his father, with all the intelligent universe, to come to our cesspool of a planet. Jesus brings with him all the accumulated guilt. Biblically, we, we call that wrath. He brings with him all the wrath of the unbelievers that have stored up their own wrath for the day of wrath. You read that in Romans 2. He brings all the wrath to place on the head of, of Satan. That's all of our forgiven transgressions and sins and iniquity that he was, that Satan was the originator of, Jesus places that all on him. And he'll take us believing brothers and sisters home to be with him where he is. Those that are lost own their lost condition. God has given us every opportunity to be saved. Some would just rather not. So I end, finally, <laughs> end with our scripture reading from this morning, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, which is to say his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Hold it fast without wavering, for he is faithful that is promised. And then Paul said, and let us consider one another to provoke, provoke, 
unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but all the more as we see what? The day approaching. Let's pray. It says in your word, Lord, being confident of this very thing that you who has begun a good work in us will bring it to the completion of the day. My prayer for us all is we look to you by faith that we avail ourselves of your cleansing blood, that you transform our lives, our hearts and minds, make us fit for heavenly places so that you can come and put an end to this insanity. In Jesus' name, amen.